Well, good morning and welcome to Christ Presbyterian Church in our 1045 service. We're so glad to have you at a place where we proclaim hope and build a home and launch a healing both in ourselves and the world around us. We're so glad for you to join us. Uh, we do have lots of things going on in the life of our church in the next couple of weeks that we want to remind you about, not the least of which is our Vacation Bible School. Uh, which starts not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. And that is a very big deal. Uh, obviously, we've got lots of activity going on next week. And so we ask you for your prayers during that time. Are we full? The children's We are full. So there is no more room for Vacation Bible School. But I'll bet you that if you're really just chomping the bit uh, to serve and to help during that week, I'll bet you Elizabeth Adrian, our children's director, will find something for you to do. I'll bet. So uh, make sure you remember that. We're also very excited that our feature missionary uh, of the week for Vacation Bible School is our own Foster and Laura Gullett. Uh, as we heard while they were here for those 18 months while Foster was finishing up his seminary work, um, they are church planters in Milan, Italy. And so one of the features that was very nice for our leadership of our church, unbelievably gracious to do, was to allow me to be able to go and see Foster and Laura uh, next week. My wife and I are actually leaving on Tuesday uh, to head to Milan, Italy to spend some time with Foster and Laura. And we look forward to bringing some videos back and showing you all the things that are going on in the ground with that church planting effort there, uh, as well as just some great reports from them. Even do some consulting with some of their church planting workers. So be it prayer for us. This is our first time to Western Europe ever. So we're very excited excited to experience some new things and see and check in on Foster and Laura. Um, look, today is kind of a big day for us because we are wrapping up and finishing our you know, 16-week study that we've done through the book of Romans, at least through the first 12 chapters of Romans. And we finish today with this one singular thought, and that is, what was the gospel trying to do in us? And what we're going to find is that Paul is teaching us that it is a total life transformation that he's after, a metamorphosis, if you will. And so what you'll notice is the entirety of our worship service is really geared around the one thing that fires that transformation in the hearts of Christians, and that is the mercies of God. And so with that in mind, I want to invite you to stand as we are called to worship from Psalm 86. Let's read responsively as the psalmist says this. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. And I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. You, O oh Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me.
together. O oh, great covenant-keeping God, we affirm with the psalmist that there is no God in heaven like you. Every people, every tribe, every tongue shall worship before you and magnify your name. So we come this morning with our whole hearts, all of our allegiance and our, our fascination to bathe once again in those waters of your steadfast, committed love we appeal to your grace again, O Lord, and cast ourselves on your mercies in the hopes that you will turn to us and heal us once again. The only sign we seek that you have loved us is the gift of your Holy Spirit falling upon this place and granting us the full vision of Jesus that only he can give. Would you assist us then in our worship this morning? For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our corporate affirmation of faith this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 2 and asks you this question, Christian church, how has God shown you mercy? God, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them.
seated. Our call to confession this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, where Peter is inviting us to consider what it is that is forming us. Indeed, what it is that we are conformed to. What are the influences in my life that are shaping me into the person I am? Peter asks us to consider this. Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Indeed, we do find ourselves in exile as Christians, which is why we pray prayers of longing, longing for Jesus to complete the work that he began in us at our conversion. So I would invite you to pray along with me our corporate confession of sin. Let's pray. O God, God, the the author author of of all good, I come to you. I step out into a wicked world. I carry about with me an evil heart. I know that without you, I can do nothing. That everything with which I am concerned, however harmless in itself, proves an occasion of sin or folly, unless I am kept by your power. Preserve my understanding from subtlety of error my affections from love of idols, my character from stain of vice, my profession from every form of evil. May I engage in nothing in which I cannot implore your blessing and in which I cannot invite your inspection. Teach me to use the world and not abuse it, to improve my talents, to redeem my time, to walk in wisdom toward those without and in kindness to those within. For Jesus' sake, amen. We pray together pre-written prayers so that we can do that together as a corporate body of Christ. But we spend also time in individual confession before the Lord as we enter into that time of silence right now. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And now won't you stand and receive the assurance of forgiveness through Christ from 1 Peter 2. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We turn to a wisdom not our own, but our confidence instead rests in God, whose steadfast love and faithfulness endure forever. Uh, and he promises us that, that all things will be made new and he will complete a good work that he began in us. And so let us sing these truths together uh, as we rejoice in singing when trials come. When trials come no Yes. 
is told Within the night I know your peace The breath of God brings strength to me And new each morning mercies flow As treasures of the darkness grow As treasures of be seated. Good morning. My name is Peyton Atchley. I'm one of the deacons here at Christ Prez. And as the ushers come forward, I want to remind you that in addition to the offering plates uh, you can give, there's a basket in the back of the sanctuary and online through our church center app. Please pray with me. Father, we ask your blessing this morning um, on these tithes and offerings. Uh, we ask that you would use them to bring about healing and hope to a broken world and to spread Christ's love both here in Oxford and to the ends of the earth. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. for food, every lung that yearns for breath, every eye that searches through the dark for light. All creation looks to you for its breath and for its food. From the goodness of your hand we're satisfied. Oh, rejoice in all your works, King of heaven, King of earth. Every creature you have made declares your praise. We rejoice in all you've made, God of all sustaining grace. With the mountain, sky, and sea, we sing your praise. Every tree that thirsts for rain, every bird that seeks its nest, every heart that waits in hope to be made glad. All creation looks to you for its breath and for its food, for the goodness of your hand we're satisfied. Oh, rejoice in all your works, King of heaven, King of earth. 
Every creature you have made declares your praise. We rejoice in all you've made, God of all sustaining grace. With the mountain, sky, and sea, we sing your praise. The ponderings of my heart and the song upon my lips with the chorus of creation join in praise to the God who made all things to the spirit who sustains to the Son who over all creation Rejoice in all your works, King of heaven, King of earth. Every creature you have made declares your praise. We rejoice in all you've made, God of all sustaining grace. With the mountain, sky, and sea, we sing your praise. Uh, Wayne Irby. I am a part-time minimum player and full-time elder, so <laughs> I'll be leading you in your uh, prayer this morning, pastoral prayer. Three and four-year-olds, you're dismissed. Uh, to my right, your left, and um, if you will help me and pray with me as I, as I lead us. Father, many times it feels like we um, gather as your people in this place, weary um, from another week full of worry and trouble. Um, this week we watched the horrific, horrific events um, at an elementary school in Texas, which came just days after a shooting in California um, and New York. We grieve over this evil. Uh, events um, on one hand seem shocking and unimaginable, um, but on the other seem, um, seem like they're becoming more and more familiar. Other events around the world add to this weariness, um, inflation, Supreme Court leaks, um, a war in Ukraine, a possible war in China, um, and a never-ending culture, gender, race conflicts, um, just to name a few. We watch these events, um, and then we add them on top of our own personal struggles. And many of us are sad, uh, tired, um, and overwhelmed. Uh, so Father, we just pray for mercy, um, to be reminded that our struggles are not in vain, um, to be reminded that our hope is not in any person um, or institution of this world to be reminded um, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. To be reminded that the world around us needs the hope that is in us. Mary came out to meet Jesus uh, to tell him the news of the death of Lazarus. And Jesus, while knowing that he will soon raise Lazarus to life again is not dismissive, but he weeps with them. He weeps for the pain of a fallen world, um, for the unnaturalness of death, for the hopelessness people feel in the face of tragedy. Father, help us to become more like Jesus, um, to run to those that are hurting around us, 
um, and, to, and to do so with the hope and the fullness of being united to you, um, the one that will make all things new. We pray for our members this week, uh, the Rones and the Robinsons. Uh, for Jameson and Megan, we pray for their marriage, um, to be godly examples to their children. Uh, Jameson asks that we pray for his job, which is, which is hectic, um, that he'll find a little rest from the busyness and, the, and safety from frequent travel. Um, we pay for, pray for peace um, as they recently lost a, a grandmother, uh, Miss Betty Fuller. Um, so we pray for Jameson's father and aunt that they can be at peace um, with her heavenly homecoming. Uh, the Rones also ask for us to pray that their girls will have a good summer as they head to Camp DeSoto um, to make lifelong friendships and to grow closer to God. For the old ones, as they venture into the teen years, we, we pray for um, a safe and fun summer and grace for, and patience for their parents. That they will lead them to Christ in every situation. Um, and we pray for little Sarah Michael as she is now full speed at, at three. Um, Craig and, and Vicki ask that, that we pray um, that as a couple, um, along with their family um, and their church family, um, that we'll all continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that through his work, word, worship, and witness, um, and to him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Our ministry this week is Kairos, um, and there's much to be thankful for. Um, after a long two-year absence, we are finally able to visit Parchman again. Um, there's much hope for both us Free World volunteers and the members um, on the inside. Um, Burl Kane, the new commissioner, um, and the new chaplains are very supportive of this ministry. And, and that seems to have started filtering down even to the staff and the officers and the guards. Um, we ask God to continue to work in hearts to raise up volunteers to join this ministry. For our Sunday School Teachers of the Week, Audrey and Chris Floyd and Hannah and Nathan Dye, um, we are so thankful for their willingness to serve. And our CPC leadership and staff this week is the Irbys. Um, so Sarah and I are thankful for our church, and we pray that God will work in our hearts to serve out of joy. We also pray that you be with Les this morning as he brings um, us your word from Romans. And we ask all these things in Christ's name who taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. Our reading uh, comes from Romans chapter 12. Um, looking at verses 1 and 2 this morning. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Word of the Lord. I wonder how many of you have ever read or were forced to read <clears throat> the book, The Metamorphosis, when you were in school. Um, St. Augustine referred to it as the golden donkey. And it's unique because it remains one of the only full, complete novels that we have from the Roman Empire around the second century AD. Uh, but what makes it interesting is that for some reason, that book still fascinates readers even today. Well, the story is about a young man, man by the name of Lucius who visits his hometown and happens to see a witch transform into an owl. 
Well, envious of the power, he drinks the same potion that she was drinking, but instead of turning into a bird, he turns into a donkey. And of course, he's told by the witch that in order to turn back into his old self, he has to eat a rose. Unfortunately, as the story goes on, he's constantly being able, uh, hindered at his ability to eat one. But after getting his belly full of his adventures as a donkey, Lucius finally meets the goddess Isis, who arrives to rescue him. And this is what she says to him in kind of a rough translation. She says, Behold, Lucius, I have come to you. Your weeping and prayers have moved me to comfort you. I am she that is the natural mother of all things, governor of all the elements, chief of divine powers, the queen of heaven. Behold, I have come to take pity on your misfortune and tribulation and here to give you favor and aid to help you leave your weeping and lamentation and put away your sorrow to see the healthful day, which is ordained by my providence. Okay, here's what I found interesting about that story. That's a pagan tale written by a pagan author. But do you hear how many resonances there are with the Christian story? I think it's uncanny. Too often, I think, Christians get very unnerved when they see Christian themes show up in pagan sources because they think somehow that maybe cheapens our belief. But I think that's actually wrong thinking. Consider this, if the God of the Bible is the God against all others, as he certainly is, wouldn't it make sense that they would imitate the actions, ape as it were, the real and true God? I actually find it kind of encouraging that Christians should see truth that we know is contained in the Bible come from other sources and other disguises. It's not authoritative, of course, but it's a nice confirmation that God's influence in the world remains despite our rejection of him. Look, I want to lay out this message this morning a little bit in the opposite way in which I usually do, which is to say, I want to begin with verse two and work backwards to verse one. And actually for a specific reason that I'll get to in just a second. But look now at verse two where Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That word you've got there translated be transformed is a Greek word literally translated as metamorphosis. Paul is saying that it is God's good plan to lay out for his gospel, from his gospel, a people who have been transformed and a transformation that takes place in a complete renovation of every area of life. It, it turns out that Lucius is transformed back into his usual self and in response, he dedicates his life to the worship of Isis. My question this morning is, where would the author of The Golden Donkey, a man named Apelius, get such an idea? Well, I want to build this message on the premise that God is always and has always been making himself known in every single nook and cranny of his creation. So that even when creative people, like this Roman author, pagan though he is, puts pen to paper... He cannot help but be drawn into a story about transformed people, about people getting healed, about people changing into what they were intended to be and coming out from the spell of their own foolishness. So this morning, we need to look very carefully at verse 1 so that we can see how it is that Paul lays out his expectation for this transformation, a Christian metamorphosis. You know, the golden donkey continues to fascinate, root, fascinate readers because I'm convinced that it's rooted in a story that we all know and want to be true. That I know I'm supposed to be moving into the direction of change. The question, though, is how does the gospel say that? Every world religion talks about changing. Every world religion mentions that there ought to be some transformation of life, but there's nothing quite like how the gospel does it to help us understand what Jesus' work was. So three points this morning. I want to look, first of all, at the sacrifice. I want to look at the body, and then finally, the mercy. Look at that first point, this word sacrifice. Look carefully at that last half of verse 1. Paul says, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Okay. Okay. When Paul uses the word sacrifice, he's clearly drawing off a tradition that would have been very obvious to Jewish readers, and that is the Old Testament sacrificial system. 
Probably more specifically, he's referring to that book that you skipped when you vowed to read through the Bible in a year called the book of Leviticus. You got through like a sentence or two of it, like I'll never understand this, and so you just skipped it. Now look, in the book of Leviticus, there's all kinds of sacrifices that get detailed in the book, but the two main ones that get offered are the sin offering and then the burnt offering. The question I want to entertain this morning is, which one is Paul referring to? I think there's actually evidence that shows he's leaning towards the burnt offering. Here's the reason why. Because the sin offering, again, if you go back to Leviticus and, hear, and read about it, sort of detailed this idea that there was blood that had to be shed and forgiveness that had to be granted by the asking worshiper. Is Paul thinking about that? Well, I don't think he is because he spent all this time in Romans unpacking how the shed blood of Jesus has brought an eternal forgiveness, which I think is the reason why he's referring to the burnt offering. That word burnt offering in Hebrew is actually the Hebrew word hola, a whole offering. Uh, in other words, it's, it's actually where we get the word holocaust, a complete destruction. And so if you go back and study Leviticus, you'll find that the emphasis on that offering was that what you brought to the altar was to be completely consumed. You burned every single bit of it on the altar. In other words, it was the totality of the sacrifice that was the point of the offering. So what is Paul saying to us then? I think very simply when he says, I want you to give your bodies over in the same way these Israelites gave to the burnt offering, he's saying, you're not going to give God any of your leftovers, period. Christianity is of a nature, he's teaching, that it takes everything. It means that Christians are those who are saying, I've come to a point where I'm willing to obey God in every single area of my life. It reminded me while I was preparing this about the ways in which I would have red flags go up during pre-marriage counseling. Campus ministry for 25 years, did a lot of pre-marriage counseling, talked to a lot of folks wanting to get and be married. But I always found that there was a red flag that would pop up when somebody was, was really hesitant about sharing something. <laughs> you would get comments like this. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean our money? That's my money. I will have my own bank account. That ain't, that ain't our money at all. Or another favorite that I got on a number of times, like, well, look, look, look. <laughs> My time out with my friends, with my time, is just that. It's my time. In the back of your mind, you're thinking like, either this is going to be an unhappy time as a marriage, or it's not going to be a marriage at all. You're not going to stick with something that has that kind of hesitancy in it. Why? Because marriage is of a sort that to try to enter into it while still withholding something means it's just not going to work. That's the nature of marriage. They're there all the time. You're building an entire life with them. So Paul justifies his request that our commitment to God be as total as that by saying this, which is your spiritual worship? That's actually kind of a confusing translation. If you read it literally in Greek, it actually says, which is your logical worship? In other words, Paul is saying, this only makes sense. <laughs> This is completely logical. In other words, to fail to give yourself in a total, complete obedience to God is not just an offense in the moral sense, like you've, you've harmed against something that are, is his wishes. He says it's also a crucifixion of your intelligence. Where one commentator said, this is as stupid as it is wicked. Think, how can you come to grips with someone who has given himself that utterly to you without you giving yourself utterly to him. That's the logic. Do you see it? That is your reasonable service, Paul says. Okay, so that's the first point, the sacrifice. Secondly, though, I want you to notice that Paul focuses on the body. Back up a little bit more in verse 1. Because Paul says he wants for Christians to, quote, present your bodies as living sacrifices. That's ah, an interesting choice of words there. And as it turns out, a huge point for this particular generation. Because Paul is very clear about what needs to be offered. That is, it is your body. And the grammar makes it pretty clear that Paul is not talking about your soul. He's not talking about the totality of your being necessarily. What he's actually saying, without being metaphorical, is it is, I want you to offer your physical body on this altar of God's sacrifice. Your body. 
Now look, most commentators drew attention to the point that Paul's language would have been immediately jarring for a first century Greco-Roman audience. Why? Well, because the prevailing philosophy of that time taught that the body was, at worst, inherently bad. Or, or at best, it was just immaterial. It was not part of the point. It wasn't the way to real transformation. If you wanted real human flourishing, they would have said, honestly, you're to set aside the inhibitions that are given to us by our physical bodies and focus on the life of the mind, the soul, the spiritual, as we say. It's the internal world of the thoughts and feelings and impressions that's the real spirituality. But of course, Christians come along and they suddenly start talking about the body in very different ways. Because for a Christian, your body is every bit as much you as your inner world was. In, in the Bible, the natural state of man is to have your body and your soul unified into one person. So much so that if for some reason, because of death, your soul is separated from your body, that is a supremely unnatural thing. I, I like to put it this way. Christians were never those people who went to funerals and said silly things like this. Well, you know, we live and we die in the circle of life. That's not a Christian view. <laughs> What, what, what Paul is saying is death represents the disillusion of what God has joined together, body and soul. And for that reason, your body is still important. It's essential. I, I used to illustrate how I thought this heresy had kind of crept, it, crept its way into uh, our thinking by hearing people ask about the question of heaven. Again, 25 years in campus ministry, oftentimes students after hearing me talk about heaven would say, I have a question. Les, when we get to heaven, are we, are we going to know each other? Think about what's behind that thought. Because in their mind, they're thinking to themselves, well, okay, when I'm you know, sort of heading up to heaven and I have this destination that I'm going to be there in heaven, um, that's going to be a spiritual place, right? And because it's spiritual, therefore, it must be immaterial, it's not a physical place. So in that case, if we're just, I don't know, these, these misty spirits kind of wafting around in heaven, how will we know each other? How will we recognize one another? <laughs> well, here's the deal. That is not the Bible's picture of heaven. We're actually going to do a bit of a dive in this this coming fall when we study through Genesis, so stay tuned. But in the Bible, heaven is not an immaterial place. You and I are separated from it now for sure. But the destiny of human civilization, please don't miss this point, is a reunited heaven and earth. It is a physical existence. It is a material existence. We do not prioritize the spiritual and the immaterial over the physical because God's intention with all humanity is to unite them and keep them united. Not the least of which is you and your spirit being united with your body. And in that day, of course, it'll be a new heavenly body that won't wear out and won't get colds and COVID and who knows what else. But of course, all that's in the future. So for the question for us then is, given that nature, what does that say to us in our day about the necessity of presenting our bodies? Well, I think at least two things are applicable to us. The first is this. There has not been a time in recent history when Christians need to be more clear on our theology of the body. Why? Well, because we live in a day where in the name of gender fluidity, the bodily, physical, even biological differences between the sexes are being outright denied. It doesn't matter what genitalia you were born with, we're told. Sexuality is on a spectrum, regardless of how your DNA was formed or informs your existence. To put it mildly, Christians have a problem with this. Not because, as it is widely reported, we are bigoted and narrow-minded, but simply because it is crucial to our theology of the body to honor and then conform our material realities to what was given to us at birth. In other words, the distinctions between the sexes are more than just biological, they are theological. 
God is saying something about not only how he deals with the world, but also how ultimately he is going to save the world. And all of it is pictured in the sexual differences between men and women, which may sound crazy. If it does sound crazy, that means we're not listening. Now look, I don't want to be, I don't want to be one of those people that's always throwing stones out there because Christians, I think, have a whole lot to grow in our understanding of how the body is dealt with. Frankly, most of the time when Christians get together and talk about the theology of the body, it's all in terms of a big no. <laughs> whatever you do, stay away from this, stay away from that, and don't do this, and whatever you do, don't do that. We have a primarily negative view of the body. In other words, when all of a sudden our view of the body devolves into warnings to stay away from problems associated with it, we take something away from the upcoming generation who doesn't know the beauties of it, the glories of it. In other words, what we find is we survey even Christian literature addressed to young people about honoring God in their, in their God-given bodies. You can be shocked to find how preoccupied we are with the negative uses of the body and never looking at what God's glorious design was from it. That's a problem. Okay, so there's a sense in which that's the first application. We gotta start working on the theology of the body. But secondly though, this one is not so much tied to our time as it is to all of hu human history. And it's this simple point. God cares about what you do with your body. That is, Christianity has never intended to be fundamentally a spiritual religion. By spiritual only, I mean. Look, even the most cursory readings of the Bible show that when this Christian metamorphosis takes place, as Paul is describing, it occurs in our bodies. For example, God is concerned about what you do with your tongue, this powerful muscle in our mouths. Words, James will tell us in the book of James, are powerful things. <laughs> so much so, he says, that you're supposed to harness that thing to keep it from doing harm to others. That's one example. Yes, secondly, God is also concerned about what we do with our sexuality. My sexual existence is a powerful part of my humanity, and God says I exercise rights over that because I'm trying to preach a message through it. I'm trying to say something to the universe about the union that I want with my people, and that is only pictured in the marriage bed. Now, and what that means is, is I think we've got to do a whole lot less arguing and stirring up controversy, uh, controversy and huffing and puffing our way to, I don't know, some other blog post that we read, and more at trying to simply say, look, we want to present what we believe is a better story about human gender and sexuality than what is being peddled in the world today. In other words, it'd be nice to have a positive construct instead of a purely negative one. By the way, I would warmly commend to you the audio from our recent city forum on sex and gender for that very topic. Thirdly, we can, we, we, God has uh, concerned about the places where I take my body, especially when certain temptations to drink so much alcohol, but I become reckless in thought, word, and deed. I realize that God is also concerned about what I put into my body. He's constantly giving me safeguards over all these things that might trip me up. My failures, as it were, are meant sometimes to even be fled, to run away from. I would even go so far as to say sometimes God cares about what I don't put into my body. You know, the older you get, you're fighting this constant battle of the bulge right here. And part of that, I've watched my own thinking about when it comes to dieting and how much I can start to reject something that God gave as a good, a good uh, gift, namely food, over a warped sense of what my body is about. I used to talk to college uh, students all the time about when was the last time you sat down to a meal and weren't preoccupied about what that meal means about your next meal. Does that make sense? Well, you know, I mean, this is awfully greasy burger, with that, but that's okay because I'll have a salad tonight. And what happens is, is I can't think about this without thinking about that. And it destroys the experience of the one thing. And God is saying, I'm claiming rights over it all. I'm here to bring a metamorphosis on everything that is, is about your body. The point is, every aspect of what a Christian does with their body belongs to Jesus. His authority extends to my body and my spirit. And I realize that there's an urgency here in more and more in our day to assert this because we've got to start talking about this. The world outside around us is totally preoccupied by it. It's time for us to arrive at this conversation. But I do realize this, that's a tall order. And the reason why it's a tall order is because whenever you start to talk about the sins of the body, 
which literally affect actual parts of my body, you start to bring up shame. Because the truth of the matter is, whenever we start to talk about this, there's all kinds of memories, memory traces inside of us that represents a list of things that actually haunt us all the time. So the question is, how is it that Paul can expect this much of us? Let's ask it a different way. What power is available to us to be able to bring about this metamorphosis? Well, that brings us to the last point. We looked at the sacrifice and the body, but consider finally the mercy. This is the kicker. And it's the reason why I wanted to do this Bible study in reverse. Look at how Paul begins verse one. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Did you notice the plural there? In other words, Paul isn't talking about God's attribute of being merciful, as real as that is. Rather, what he's talking about is the specific things God did in Christ and continues to do in us to keep us living in that sacrificial posture. They are mercies that are there. You see, Paul understands and arguably has been unpacking for the first 11 chapters of Romans that the great question in human transformation, this huge question what it means to change as a Christian, will never be safe in the hands of human willpower to bring it about. That's not the path, nor your mental acuity or, or, or any other human capacity. Quite the contrary. If real change is going to happen, if real transformation is going to occur, it has to occur from the depth of our own motivational centers, from the place where gratitude and allegiance constantly flow. In other words, Paul is saying that this metamorphosis that I'm pushing on his readers only happens when you have in full view of your heart, this fundamental motivational center, the, the, the high definition, full 4K view of God's mercies towards us. This is the difference. It is his mercy that draws us into transformation and change. And I can tell you this, after living with religious people my entire life, the Christian view of transformation and sanctification is at one time both the most beautiful, grace-centered, sweet approach to change and it's also the most terrifying and therefore the most difficult. Why? Well, because this, because God is not looking into our lives to do a little bit of light pruning here and there. He wants everything. And if you dive into that mercy and you begin to live with it for a while, you're going to see that it begins to demand more and more and more and more of you until there comes such a time where you say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ. More and more. You start talking about how the mercy of God transforms us and you almost cannot not think about Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. The hero, of course, is Jean Valjean, who is a recipient of exactly these kinds of mercies. While Valjean, just escaped from prison, no less, is staying at a, at a priest's house, his real thievery comes back out, and he steals a candlestick and tries to escape. But, of course, very quickly he is captured by the authorities and brought back to the priest's home. Well, incredibly, the priest looks at the authorities and says, no, actually... I gave Valjean that candlestick. Oh, as a matter of fact, he forgot this other one. Here, take this other one too, Valjean. And people oftentimes miss the point though. It's not just that the priest showed favor to someone, a man to whom he owed nothing. That's not the offense. The priest showed favor to a thief, to a rebel, to one who had personally harmed him, an offender. In other words, he gives his kindness to someone, mercy to someone who deserved just the opposite. We're used to saying, I heard one author put it this way, we're used to saying that God has unconditional love for his people. That really doesn't cover it. God's love for us is contra-conditional. It's the opposite of what you'd expect. It certainly is the opposite of what is deserved. So what does that do in the life of Valjean? Well, listen to Victor Hugo in, the, in this section in his book on this. He says, Valjean did not know if he had been touched or humiliated. Hold that thought. 
In opposition to this celestial kindness, he summoned up his pride. The priest's pardon was the most formidable attack he had ever sustained, and he felt his hardness of heart would be complete if he could just resist this kindness. That if he yielded to it, he would then have to renounce the hatred with which his mistreatment by others had filled his soul and in which he had found great satisfaction. In the face of this assault, he knew that he had to conquer or be conquered. Now here's my question. Why would Valjean have to fight the mercy that the priest was trying to give him? Why was he doing that? I think it's because of this, because the act of mercy, if it is as true as it is, and it absolutely is, Valjean knows instinctively that he has to change. Nothing can be the same if someone loves you that much. My whole life, my body must go through a complete metamorphosis into the image of Christ if someone cares for me that much and has shown me that quality of mercy. That's the dare. Look, we're finished this week. This is our last lesson that we're going to do through the book of Romans. From here on out, from chapters 12 through 16, Paul will unpack specific illustrations of how this mercy gets played out, and I would warmly commend it to your own personal study. But I'll say this. There's a lesson to be drawn here at the very end, and it's simply this, that when you begin to experience the grace of God, you are inevitably going to feel the way Valjean felt. Because when God starts to open up the heart, when he starts to tell you just how much he loves you, you're going to know you're experiencing the grace of God because you're going to suddenly begin to feel your freedom slipping away. Your autonomy will suddenly look foolish. Your self-rule will become more and more embarrassing because we are in view of the mercies. And here's the thing, it's crazy threatening. It takes a ton of faith to give my life over to him for that reason. That's the reason why I think he said to Valjean that he was simultaneously touched, but also humiliated at the same time. That is the paradox of grace. But it's also the the, the invitation of the book of Romans. And I do think that, and it's been a great excursion. My hope in all of this was that we could somehow unpack the meticulous nature by which Paul looks at what it means to be someone who's driven by grace. So my invitation to you this morning is don't miss this opportunity. Has this grace gripped you? Not you as, a, as an idea, but you as an individual person with a body and a heart and a heart that has allegiance to something. Can you stand, as the old translation used to say, in view of the mercy? Can you see it? And I think it also bears for us as a community of people, are we known in this community as a grace-centered church? As a place who sets the mercies of God in front of God's people? Because according to Paul, it's only that way in which any transformation happens. It's the only way in which culture gets overturned. It's the only way in which the battles that we feel like we constantly fight emotionally are ever found any ground in. By the mercies. That's the way. And if we can lead into that, and maybe that even in our closing song, we could taste it. Let's pray. Then, Lord Jesus, lead us into it. Show us the way. Show us exactly how much you have won for us. And give us grace, Father, because our our eyes are clouded by a thousand different worries, a thousand different thoughts. But if you would bring us and show us again, if thou hast drawn a thousand times, the the hymn writer says, draw us, Lord, again, even in this place. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song. My God is the theme of my song, the joy of my heart and the boast of my tongue. Thy free grace alone from the first to the last hath won my affections and bound my soul fast. Without thy sweet mercy I could Still keeps me
wonders to feel its own hardness depart. Dissolved by thy goodness, I fall to the ground and weep for the praise of the mercy I found. Great Father of mercies, thy goodness I own and the covenant love of thy crucified Son. Oh, praise to the Spirit whose whisper divine seals mercy and pardon and righteousness mine. Oh, praise to the Spirit whose whisper divine seals mercy and pardon and righteousness mine. Thank you so much for being a part of our worship here this morning. We hope that you enjoyed just a gorgeous weekend in Oxford. It's nice to have that cool weather, wasn't it, this weekend? And don't forget, if you're a praying person, please pray for Vacation Bible School, which starts not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. And if you've got any time in a couple weeks, we'd love to have you come and help us out with some of the fun that we're going to have there for Vacation Bible School. In the meantime, though, receive a good word from the Lord. And now may this God who by his living mercies has won for himself our whole selves, body and souls, Transform us into his likeness that we might advance his kingdom throughout the world. And all God's people said, amen. Go in peace.